All right, in this lesson, we're going to talk about uh, NumPy, uh, I guess short for numerical Python. Uh, it's a very popular module that a lot of people use to do numerics uh, in Python, much in the way that you would possibly use MATLAB. Uh, what it really is is a, a set of data structures that allow us for efficient computation of arrays or lists of numbers. And we can use it in combination with other packages like SciPy uh, that offer a bunch of built-in functions to do scientific computations. So basically today we're just going to talk about, uh, well in this lecture we're just going to talk about kind of the data structures and how to use them uh, within NumPy. So if you haven't figured it out, uh, you know, Python is pretty slow. Uh, in doing pure numerics. It, it's, you know, much slower than C, sometimes, you know, maybe it's ten times as much. And it has to do with the dynamic typing or duck typing. So in duck typing, you know, if it looks like a duck, then it is a duck. Uh, it's also known as, as dynamic typing. And everything in Python is an object. If you're familiar with object-oriented programming, uh, you'll know what an object is. but so everything, including you know, the most simple types of data, integers and floats and other things, are objects. And uh, you know, these objects carry a lot of metadata around with them. It basically uh, lets the interpreter know at all times what exactly the type of data is. And so the interpreter, when you run Python, actually spends a lot of its time trying to figure out exactly what type of data it is. And, how much, it, you know, where it's stored in memory and, and otherwise. So uh, NumPy offers us a solution in that we get a set of data structures. They, they're also objects as well, uh, but they have a single type and, and continuous, continuous storage. So the single type can actually be an object itself, but it could also be, uh, you know, a 32-bit integer, a 64-bit float, a complex number. Uh, many, many things, uh, Boolean values, you know, true or false. Uh, so it derives its speed by having a, a common functionality uh, across all the different data types that are implemented in the C language. So whenever we iterate over uh, a, an entire list, for instance, um, that iteration is actually being handed off and done in compiled code in, in C, and so it's much, much faster and you know, actually, kind of approaches the, the C speed. Not not as fast as C, but it but it begins to take on, uh, you know, get get closer to the speeds that you'll see in the C language. So let's just do a quick example, uh, basically comparing Python to no, uh, a similar function and in, in, or similarable uh, similar similar case that will run in uh, NumPy. So for this problem, uh, it's, we're going to use this time it module, which is offered on the Python command line. And I'll switch over and basically reproduce the example that you see here on the slide. I'll, I'll go ahead and reproduce it uh, in the terminal just so you can see how to use this time it module. So uh, from the uh, command line, we're going to run Python. We use the uh, dash m time it to indicate that we want to run this time it module. The dash s is an option to time it that basically says run these uh, first commands that I'm going to enter a single time. So in this case, I'm going to create a list with a million elements. And then the last argument, which is in parentheses, is the command you actually want to run and be timed. So I want to basically do a list comprehension over that list I just created where in, I'm just going to add one to every uh, every entry. So you know the, the entries will be zero, one, two, three, four. I'm going to add one to them all. So um, so then I'll see you know instead of zero, one, two, three, four, and then I'll have one, two, three, four, or five uh, for those entries. And so when you run time it, it actually is going to run a series of loops and and take the fastest three and give you an average. Um, uh, or the, an average of the best three. So if we run this, you'll see it's running, and it tells us that it did 10 loops, and the best, the average best three is 87.8 milliseconds per loop. Okay? Um, 
that, that's actually uh, microseconds per loop. But uh, we can do much better in, in NumPy. So if we run this same command, this time we're going to run Python time it and the f the first thing we're going to do is import numpy then we're going to use numpy to create an array sorry I'll use the array range and this will also have a million elements in it and then we can simply use NumPy's broadcasting feature to add one to every entry in the array, uh, like so. And then when we run that, you'll see that we get 3.83 uh, microseconds per loop. So in that time, it did 100 loops. Uh, it, time it will automatically decide how many uh, loops to do. It, the more, the better, uh, of course. But if it's taking too long per loop, uh, it won't leave you there stranded, it'll, it'll shorten that amount. Uh, but the more you do, of course, you'll get a more accurate estimate of how long it takes to run. So this is basically the example that I showed here. I just wanted to show you how, from the command line, how you actually enter, uh, enter those commands such that you can, you can visualize the results the same way. You can actually import this time at module uh, into a non-interactive Python session to set up timers to see which parts of your code uh, you know, are taking the longest time if you'd like. So what NumPy then gives us is uh, these array data structures that have universal functions defined uh, or methods that, that are defined on them so, such that we can operate in an, an element by element fashion. So all of the arithmetic operators plus minus divide uh, multiply and exponent are overloaded to work in an element by element fashion. So unlike, you know, for instance, MATLAB, uh, if you say A times B in MATLAB, you're going to get uh, the vector dot product if, if A and B are vectors. Uh, in NumPy, if A and B are vectors or arrays, you're going to get an element by element multiplication. And so it's a little more consistent in that sense because that's what you'd expect in NumPy or MATLAB if you said A plus B, then you get an element by element addition. Uh, however, in, in MATLAB, of course, the default here is to do the dot product, which can be a little confusing. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about how to do a dot product in NumPy. So again, uh, here you can show that uh, if you did it in pure, in pure uh, Python, this would be, you'd have to use a list comprehension to create a list in which you're taking the sign of every entry and squaring it, uh, whereas in NumPy, we can basically do that in a short one-line command like this. So there's many ways to create NumPy arrays. Uh, you, can, uh, you can simply enter in the numbers you'd like, you know, in this case, uh, 2, 3, 11. Um, you can actually create NumPy arrays that have mixed data types. So in this case, uh, this would be a floating point uh, entry. This would be an integer entry. And this would be a complex entry. And in this case, uh, the, the uh, array itself is going to have the types of uh, the type object. It's going to have a, a data type. And we'll, we'll come back and talk about what these are a little bit later. But the data type here would actually be object. Because each of these are different, they're stored in their, in their own object. And uh, you know, however, if they were all the same, uh, then you would have you could have define them you know say data type float and in this case if you define if you explicitly define the data type to be float even though these are entered as integers here meaning there's no decimal place after them they'll be converted to uh, floating point numbers uh, we can also create uh, linear space so in this case the first entry would be where you start uh, the second would be uh, the increment, so it would be in increments of four, and the, then the total number, which would be six. Um, you can also uh, you create indice arrays, and you can also read in data from a file uh, as such. So then once we have the data structures, we can do kind of sophisticated slicing or get information or re reshape them. Um, so 
basically, first of all, if we, if in this case, uh, if we look, we're gonna we're gonna import NumPy and we're gonna give it a shortcut NP so that we don't have to write out NumPy every time. Uh, but then we're gonna say MP a range nine. This is gonna create uh, a contiguous array, a one-dimensional array, uh, being zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, all in a row. And then we're gonna reshape that into basically a three by three matrix, if you will. So then it'll have in one row, zero, one, two, three. I'm sorry, zero, one, two. Then the next row, three, four, five. And then the next row, six, seven, eight. Okay, so then we could do slicing. So for instance, this, this uh, command right here would take uh, all of the first column. Uh, so all, all of the rows in the, in the first column. So that would be a way to slice out uh, the first column. And you can see what's returned here. Uh, if you wanted to know the shape of X, there's some uh, functions that you can, you can check the shape of X. So you just say X dot shape here. Uh, x dot strides will give you basically the strides uh, in number of bytes along the array. So in this case, it's 24 bytes uh, along one row. Of course, you know each uh, each entry here has eight bytes. Uh, they're integers, and so you'd have eight bytes. Eight times three in a row in a three columns would be 24. So 24 bytes along the first column. Um, some other more sophisticated slicing would be this would take the actually every other the second you know it would skip so every other entry along the first uh, col along all columns and every entry every other entry along all rows okay and then you can also uh, assign values directly into an entry so if you wanted to in the first row first column of y assign it the value 100 uh, then you could just set it directly equal to it and, and you'd, get, you'd get that there. So you can see uh, what happens if you make the assignment and then you do the evaluation. We can use this sophisticated sliping, slicing to do kind of very efficient and compact, you know, finite difference notation. So here I'm, I'm, uh, I'm creating a, uh, um, a, an, a uh, NumPy array that starts at 0 and goes to 20 and 2, so 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. And then uh, for the y value, I'm, I'm going to set that equal to x squared, okay? And so we can just uh, basically square every entry of x this way, and then we can find the finite difference. So in the finite differences, we're going to take um, from, the, from the first value, uh, from the first value on of y, uh, I'm sorry, starting with, the, this is one is actually the second index. So from the second to the end, and then from the first to the end minus one, okay? And then I'm gonna make the differences. So you know, let me maybe write out what one, one entry of this would be. So for the, f for the first value, what you would get is y, one minus y zero, okay? And then for the second one, you'd have y two minus y one, and so on, and it would continue that way. And of course, we know that, you know, the real derivative here, um, dy dx, is equal to 2x, and the finite differences are evaluated at the midpoints. So uh, the midpoint of of x in in, in turn that goes in, in you know 2 minus 0, the midpoint of that is 1. So the first value, if you plugged in 1 for x, you'd expect to get 2 here. Okay, the second midpoint would be 3. So then 3 times 6, you'd get you know I'm sorry, 3 times 2 is 6. So you can see that the the actual answer is correct um, if you you know if you compare it with the exact value of the derivative. Okay, so NumPy also has these sophisticated broadcasting rules. Um, I won't get into actually exactly what the rules are, but you can look them up if you need to know. But uh, just an interesting example that you know what you could do here is basically. You could create a, an, eight, an 800 by 600 image 
of red, blue, and uh, green values. This actually should not be here. So you can you can create a, a 600 by 800 image of red, random, you know, red, blue, and green values, and then when you when you put them all together, uh, you'll end up with a uh, a big um, big you know three by 800 by 600 array, and then if we transpose that such that instead of three rows, we'll then have three columns. We can multiply that by a simple a row that has 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So this would basically uh, lighten the image, if you will. So the, the first one would be multiplying all the red values. Uh, this would be multiplying all the green values. This would be multiplying all the uh, blue values. So uh, in other words, you know, the, what's nice about this is that, you know, normally you, it wouldn't make sense to multiply uh, a, a six, an 800 by 600 by three column array times an array of three entries, but the broadcasting feature in NumPy allows us to do that. So NumPy, as I mentioned earlier, has a very sophisticated view of the data. Um, you can have a lot of control over the data types, uh, almost, I guess, as much control as you would in C. You can have, say, unsigned integers. This would be really important if you're really, uh, you know, trying to manage the memory really efficiently. So, uh, as I kind of hinted at earlier, if you wanted to assign an explicit data type, you use this data type command here, and uh, it would return the data type that you correct, uh, that you asked for. So, uh, as I mentioned, the, the dot product uh, in NumPy, you actually have to call out, out the dot product, but it is sophisticated enough to know that if you're doing uh, vector, vector multiplication, then you'll end up with a scalar. Uh, versus if you're doing matrix vector multiplication, then you end up with a vector. Or if you do matrix matrix multiplication, you end up with a matrix. So uh, it will, uh, it is smart enough to figure out what what your intentions are when you use the dot product. But you have to explicitly call it out with the dot uh, function there. Um, so there's several other modules. Linear algebra offers a set of like sparse. Uh, data structures. So if you have matrices that have a bunch of zeros in them, uh, you can store them in, in these uh, kind of sparse um, uh, data structures from the linear algebra pa package. Uh, there's also random, which I showed, which is a, basically a random number generating package. There's an FFT package. Uh, there's other ones that I'm not mentioning, but uh, you know this gives you an idea. The main thing we want to understand about NumPy is these data structures, because we'll be using them a lot as we go on and, and learn SciPy here very soon.